tonight we begin a three-part series. How many? Three. three parts. And these three parts cover a topic that is very important biblically, but a, a topic that unfortunately is not well understood. It addresses the topic of the judgment the judgment from a biblical perspective. Now, when we use the word judgment or the word judgment comes into the mind, many times we see that as a negative thing. We think, oh, the judgment, we begin to shake and it's sort of this fear and trepidation of this impending judgment, guilty sort of a thing. What we're going to discover from a biblical perspective is that the judgment is actually good news for those who have put their faith and their confidence in Christ. And that's why the title is, um, there really is a final judgment. There really is a final judgment. But don't be afraid, it's good news. So let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll dive right into our presentation. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening and we are anticipating a great blessing. You have been with us uh, so many nights and Father, you've blessed us, you've enriched us, you've given us a biblical understanding of so many things. And Father, now as we embark from from a biblical perspective upon this topic of the judgment, particularly as it, as it refers and, and references Bible prophecy, we ask, Father, that your spirit will be with us. We want to thank you for the insights that you've already given. As we have opened your word, you have opened our hearts. And so, Father, tonight we ask that the spirit that inspired this word, the, the spirit that inspired the Bible, would now come into this room and be the spirit that instructs us. Father, please, through this humble vessel, do something awesome, do something supernatural, and may we come apart here with a clearer, more biblical, more accurate understanding of who you are and just exactly what this judgment entails. For we ask it in Jesus' name, and let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Okay, great. So let's go right to our study guide. We do have quite a little bit of information to cover tonight. And so I want to make you that same promise I have in nights past. If I go so fast tonight that you just cannot follow me, which seems unlikely because I'm afraid to go too fast or my voice might just turn off. But if somehow I'm able to go too fast tonight so that you cannot keep up with me, you just go back to that CD table. You say, Randy, I couldn't understand what he was saying. I only got half of my blanks filled in and I need a free CD. And David said that you'd give me one. We will give you one. If I go so fast tonight that you can't get it, it doesn't do you as much good as we want it to. Now, I did tell you that I speak four times faster than the average person. And so if you only get half of what I say, you get twice as much as a normal speaking person would. Okay? So let's go right to our study guide. And it says, this series of presentation covers a very important topic, the sanctuary. With a raising of hands, how many know what the sanctuary is? The biblical sanctuary. Good. The sanctuary, that is the temple of God. We must begin by noting that there are two temples an earthly and a heavenly. And that's going to be absolutely central, absolutely fundamental to our study this evening and in the forthcoming nights. Two temples, an earthly and a heavenly. We'll look at that in just a moment. As we shall soon discover, the temple on earth was a picture or a model of the temple where? In heaven. Just as the high priest ministered in the earthly sanctuary, Jesus Christ, our high priest, is ministering where? in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, before we do that, we want to set this all in its proper context, okay? I'm going to give you several texts here. Now, don't worry if you can't get all of these. That's fine. But what I want to try and show you is that from a biblical New Testament perspective, the judgment was future to the New Testament writers. That's critical. The judgment was future to the New Testament writers. Now, none of these texts are in your study guide tonight. And so if you want these, you're going to have to write them down. Now, we will go over these texts again at least one more time. But I just want to quickly go over them with you here on the board. Now, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Luke writing, Paul speaking. Because he, be, he being God, has appointed a what? A day on the which he what? will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. That man, of course, being Jesus Christ. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, in the English language, we have three verb tenses. How many verb tenses? Three. three. Past and present and future. Now you say, of course, there's only three verb tenses. Well, in other languages, there are actually many different verb tenses. You have past perfect and past imperfect and present continuous, etc. But in the English language, we have just past and present and future. Now I want you to notice this again, keeping that in mind. Because he has appointed a day on the which he what? He will judge. What verb tense would that be? Future tense. He will do it. Okay, now notice the next passage here, very similar. Acts chapter 24 and verse 25. Again, Luke writing, Paul speaking. Now as he, Paul, reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and notice this, 
and the judgment, what are the next two words? To come, Felix was afraid and said, go away for now, and when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. So Paul was speaking to Felix, and he was talking about righteousness, he was talking about temperance, and the judgment that was what? To come, which means it was in the future. Very good. We'll show you a few other texts here to that effect. There are many in the New Testament. We really want to solidify this in our thinking as we commence with this three-part series on the judgment. Romans 2.16, the Apostle Paul. In the day when God, what? shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so if you're paying attention, two things are beginning to emerge. Number one, the judgment was future to the Bible writers. That is the New Testament writers. Can everyone say amen? amen. Okay. The second thing that you're noticing is, is that Jesus Christ is central to the judgment. Did you notice that? Notice it says here, he will judge the secrets of men by who? Jesus Christ, exactly. So those are the two things that are emerging here. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? That's a good question for us. Sometimes we can be very judgmental. Paul says, hey, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we what? Shall. We shall. What verb tense with that? Future. Future tense. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of who? Christ. And so you see both things there in that passage. The judgment is future and Christ is central to the judgment message. And one last one, Romans chapter 14, 11 and 12. For it is written as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And so there are other passages that could be presented here. It looks like I threw one more in. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord, what? Shall judge his people. So it should be crystal clear to us that from the perspective of the New Testament writers who were writing just about the first century A.D., of course, for them, the judgment was always in the future. Not in the past, not in the present. Paul reasoned of judgment to come. Judgment what, everyone? To come. So that's the first thing we really want to solidify in the thinking as we commence this three-part series. Now let's do a little bit of review. We've been over this before, but it's absolutely essential that we see the judgment in the big scheme of things. We spent a little time uh, in the second night of our meetings looking at this statue here, and a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and that statue represented a great timeline. A great timeline. That's right. What was the head of gold, everyone? Babylon. Chest and arms of silver? Meet of Persia. Belly and thighs of bronze? Greece. The long legs of iron was? Rome. And then down there, the feet of iron and clay? Divided Rome. Very, very good. And then we saw those beasts in Daniel chapter 7. In fact, why don't we go there together? Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And here we found that important Bible principle of review and enlarge. Very good. A students in the front row. That doesn't mean you're not A students in the back row. Doesn't mean that at all. It just means we've got some A students here in the front row. So, God would review, just as any good teacher would do, just as any good uh, educator would do. He reviews the material he's been over, and then he begins to enlarge upon that material. And so here in Daniel chapter 7, we saw not four metals, but four beasts. And the first was a lion that had eagle's wings, and that represented, of course, the same thing that the head of gold did, Babylon, reigning from 605 to 539 B.C. After that, there was a bear with three ribs in the mouth. Remember that? What was unusual about that bear? It was tipped up on one side, showing an imbalance of power. That's exactly right. And that was the Medo-Persian power reigning from 539 to 331 B.C., corresponding with the chest and arms of silver. Then we move to the four-headed strange leopard with four wings of a fowl, corresponding with Greece. And you remember the four heads of the leopard represented the kingdom of Greece. After Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided into how many parts? Four parts. That's exactly right. Alexander the Great's last words were, the kingdom goes to the strongest, okay, from 331 to 168 B.C. We also told you that it wings in Bible prophecy represent, does anyone remember? Speed. And a leopard is one of the fastest land mammals, and so you put four wings on a leopard, you have a fast-moving beast, okay? And, of course, Greece, uh, the, the great uh, uh, kingdom of Greece of antiquity, Alexander the Great began to conquer the then-known world at the age of 16, and by the time he was 32, he had completed it. In fact, it is said on one occasion that Alexander the Great wept because he said there was no one left to kill. And so then we move to the long legs of Rome. That's right. And here this beast, this ferocious, terrible, horrific beast, reigning for one, almost 700 years from 168 B.C. all the way down, 476 A.D. That would be the great iron monarchy of Rome. And we've given you actually several quotations from secular historians who support this basic, broad chronology. But then Rome was divided. It was not conquered. Rome was what, everyone? Divided. And how many toes would there be on this image? 
Ten toes. How many horns came out of that beast? Ten. And what kind of teeth did that beast have? Iron teeth, corresponding with the iron in the legs. And so God here is simply reviewing. He's what, everyone? Reviewing. And then you remember there was that, there was that little horn. I want to go back to that slide there. Come on. Have mercy. Oh, maybe I should point it this way at the computer. There we go. All right. So there was that little horn, and that was the new information. So you're there in Daniel chapter 7. Let's pick it up. Daniel chapter 7. If you've been following along, you get right up to verse 7, and that, that's the beasts. Okay, so I'll pick it up in verse 7. You'll know right where we are. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten, ten horns. Now, watch this. Verse 8. I was considering the horns. Daniel says, I was thinking about those horns. Something about the horns caught his attention. Now, remember, what does the word consider mean? It means what? Let's see, if I say, well, let, let me consider it. What am I saying? Let me think about it. So Daniel says, I was thinking about the horns, and there came up another horn, a what? A little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking what? Pompous words. This little horn is none other than the Antichrist power. We've already identified this individual. Very interesting, though. Notice it says that he sees this little horn coming up, and the little horn is speaking what? Pompous words. Now, what is the very next thing that Daniel sees? Look at verse 9. This is absolutely critical. Verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who's the Ancient of Days? That would be God the Father. The Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow. His hair was like the hair of, uh, was like pure wool. His throne a fiery flame and its wheels a burning fire. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued from before him. Uh, it says, thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And notice this last part. The court was what? Seated and the books were open. Now I want you to notice that sequence. Just imagine with me that you're Daniel. Who are you everyone? You're Daniel, and God is showing you something in vision, in vision. Okay, and so you see this lion with eagle's wings come up, and you're watching it across the cinematic screen of the sky, and then you see this, the bear with the three ribs in the mouth come up, representing the Medo-Persian Empire, and you're seeing across the cinematic screen of the sky, and then you see a four-headed leopard come up, move across the cinematic screen of the sky, and then you see this dreadful, terrible beast coming up, strong and horrific, and he goes across and fades down off the screen, and then you come up and you see a little horn, right, the ten horns, and then you see this little horn, and what's the very next thing that Daniel sees on that cinema screen? He sees a judgment scene in heaven. Do you see that there? Yes or no? Look at verse 8. The last words of verse 8 are a mouth speaking what? Pompous words. Then verses 9 and 10 he says, I saw the judgment in heaven. So if you were going to look at this in chronology, it's actually very simple. He sees Babylon. Then he sees Medo-Persia. Then he sees Rome. Then he sees divided Rome. Greece, pardon me. Then he sees divided Rome, Rome and then divided Rome. Then he sees the judgment scene. Is that clear, everyone? Yes or no? Let's do it again. Let's see if I can get it right this time. He sees Babylon, Medo-Persia, then Greece. Greece, then Rome, Rome then divided. divided Rome, and then the judgment. judgment. The little horn and then the judgment. You've got it. Exactly. So let's look at this. Here are the great time periods of Daniel chapter 7. Write these down. They're right on your study guide. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, little horn. Then the very next thing that Daniel saw was the judgment. That's the very next thing he saw. Okay? That sequence has to be absolutely indelibly impressed upon your mind. In fact, that sequence is so important that it occurs three times in Daniel chapter 7. Okay? Three times you see that identical sequence. Now, I'm giving you a little moment there to write that down. But for those of you who are right with me, let me show you something fascinating. You're still there in Daniel chapter 7. Okay, you're in Daniel chapter 7. Look with me at verse nine, 19. Daniel chapter 7, verse 19. What verse, everyone? 19. Then I wish to know the truth about the which, which beast? The fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. So who's that great, terrible, horrific fourth beast? Rome. So verse 19 is Rome. In my Bible, I've put a little R there. A little R, that tells me that's Rome. Now look at verse 20. And the ten what? Horns that were on its head, and the other horns which came up after, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes, like, uh, had eyes and mouth which spoke, 
pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. That's the little horn. Do you see that? So verse 19 is Rome. Verse 20 is the little horn. Now, without even looking at verse 21, without even looking at it, what do you think would be the next thing? Judgment. Judgment. Look at verse 21. It says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. That's still the little horn. Look at verse 22. Until the ancient of days came and a judgment was given in favor of the who? The saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. You're exactly right. You see the sequence. That's the second time. So it goes here from Rome to the little horn to the judgment. You've got it. Now, something very interesting there in that verse, if you picked it up, verse 22, it says judgment was given in what? In favor of the saints. Who are the saints? We are, God's people. Now, look at this. See if you can pick it up again. I'm in verse 23. Watch the sequence again. Verse 23. Thus he said, this is the angel explaining the vision. It's a very simple vision as a matter of fact. The fourth beast shall be a fourth what? Kingdom, kingdom on the earth. What shall be different from all other kingdoms? It shall devour the whole earth and trample it and break it in pieces. What kingdom is he talking about there? Rome. So in my Bible, I have a little R I've written by verse 23. Very simple. Now look at verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise out of this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and he shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall intend to change times and laws. We've spent time on this. Then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, look at that. In verse 23, you have Rome. In verses 24 and 25, you have the little horn. Now, without looking at your Bible, what do you think you would expect in verses 26 and 27? Exactly. Look at 26 and 27. But the what shall be seated? The court shall be seated, and they will take away his dominion to consume it and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Can you say amen? amen. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all... Uh, all dominion shall serve and obey him. So three times in Daniel chapter 7. It is, it is unmistakably clear. Three times you see Rome, little horn, judgment. Did everyone see that? Three times. Rome, little horn, judgment. Rome, little horn, judgment. Let's say it all together. Rome, little horn, judgment. There it is. Okay? Now let's continue on here. If you are paying careful attention, you notice that the very reason that the heavenly court is called the session is because of the blasphemous words of the little horn. The little horn is basically shooting his mouth off against God, against God's people. And we're going to see that more in just a moment here. And so God calls his court to session to overrule the kangaroo court of the little horn. Okay, and notice this one. The persecution of God's people calls to session the heavenly court. That's, in fact, you'd write that in right there. If you were paying attention, you got it. Okay? Right there at the bottom of page one, the pompous words of the little horn call to, the heavenly se uh, call to session the heavenly court. Additionally, the persecution of God's people in God's name calls to session the heavenly court. Okay? That's all right there. The judgment is a major theme of Daniel 7, the sequence, Rome, Little horn, judgment, occurs three times in this one chapter alone. Okay? If this much is clear so far, let's say amen. amen. Okay, that's all for tonight's presentation. We'll see if... I no, I'm just kidding. Now, I want you to jump up. Jump back up there to the paragraph just above that subheading where it says Daniel 7. Everyone see that? Let's fill that in. Daniel 7 deals largely with political kingdoms and political movements. Daniel 8 covers basically the same time period, but primarily addresses spiritual issues and spiritual battles. We'll be in Daniel 8 in just a moment. The beasts of Daniel 7 are predatorial beasts. That's what you'd write in there. I mean, look at these beasts. You've got a lion, you've got a bear, you've got a leopard, and some horrifically terrible beast that was so, so bad, Daniel couldn't even describe it. And so the beasts of Daniel chapter 7 were beasts of prey or predatorial beasts. Okay? Now, what's going to happen in just a few moments, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 8. But what we find in Daniel chapter 8 is not leopards and lions and bears. You know what we find there? A ram and a goat. In fact, that's what you'd write in there. It says the beasts of Daniel 8 are clean beasts. You might be saying, did he say clean? Did he think that they'd taken a bath? Yeah, we say clean, we mean ritually and ceremonially clean in the mind of the Israelite. They were clean beasts from the sanctuary service. Okay? Designed to teach two very different things. In Daniel 7, it's primarily political. It's primarily what? Political. But in Daniel 8, there's a shift 
to a more spiritual emphasis. And we'll pick that up here in just a moment. In fact, I think that's actually where we're going to go in just uh, seconds. Let's go to our second page here. Now, we said this this morning, but it bears repeating. There was a time when being a Christian meant something. Can you say amen? There was a time when it meant more than having the little fish on the back of your car. There was a time when being a Christian meant more than having the t-shirt. There was a time when being a Christian meant more than just going to church. There was a time when if you took a stand for Jesus, you took a stand for His Word, that'd be the last thing you ever did. Are we clear on that? I mean, beloved, there, were, there was a time called the Dark Ages where all you had to do as a Christian was walk up to an idol or to a, uh, uh, some sort of a statue, perhaps, of, uh, of the Roman emperor and take a little pinch of incense and just drop it before that thing and walk away and you were fine. And Christians said, no, I can't do that. And they would be killed and slaughtered and put into the uh, Colosseum there to be torn apart by, by angry lions and other beasts just because they refused to capitulate on one of God's commandments. So there was a time when saying you were a Christian meant more than it does for many people today. Can you say amen to that? Amen. During that period of the Dark Ages. That, that was a, ter a terrific, amazing time when people had to be very courageous, very bold to stand for truth. We talked about this this morning. Martin Luther stood before the Council at Worms, April 17th, 1521. And he said, listen, if you can demonstrate to me by, by the scriptures or according to just plain reason, I will recant. But if you cannot, I cannot step down. It's neither safe nor wise to go against my conscience. Here I stand. God help me. Powerful. And Martin Luther walked right out of there with absolute confidence in God. And some people thought that was the last thing he was ever going to do. And Martin Luther died of old age. He say amen? Very interesting. Now go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 and the little horn's attack on God's people. We're at the top of page 2 on your study guide. In Daniel 8, the focus is clearly spiritual in nature. It addresses the spiritual attack made by the little horn on God and His people. Now, we're just going to read through, beginning in Daniel chapter 8, quite a little bit of this vision so you can see just how simple it is. Just how what, everyone? Simple. Here we go. Verse 1. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. So he says, I got this vision after the one in Daniel chapter 7. Verse 2. I saw in vision, and it so happened that while I was looking, I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uli. That he's telling you basically the circumstances, the surroundings of when he received the vision. Verse 3. Then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw there, standing beside the river, there was a what? A ram, which had how many horns? Two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up what? Last. So here Daniel sees a ram. Notice a clean beast, not a predatorial beast. Now we could say, ooh, I wonder what the ram is. Maybe it's China. Maybe it's North Korea. Who's the ram? Well, we don't need to guess and wonder. Just stay there in Daniel chapter 8 and jump down to verse 20. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20, the angel comes and says, hey, Daniel, let me tell you what the ram is. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of what? Media and Persia. So the ram is Media Persia. That's pretty easy, isn't it? I mean, the angel just says it. The ram is Media Persia. Okay, now notice what happens next. We're now in verse 4. I saw the ram pushing, now pay very careful attention here, verse 4. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward. How many directions is that? Three. Three directions. How many ribs did the bear have in his mouth? Three. You're getting it. All we're doing is reviewing. Different, different language, different pictures here, same history. History doesn't change. History is the same, but God is using different emphases here to bring out different points and to, and to really focus our attention on whatever it is He has in mind at that moment. So it says here, the ram was pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand Him, nor was there any that could deliver from His hand, but He did according to His will, and He became what? Great. great. Now, if, if you're in the habit of underlining in your Bible, I would, I would circle great. Okay, that's going to become important in just a moment. Okay, so let's say that together. The ram became great. Okay, what's the next thing Daniel sees? Very simple vision. Verse 5. As I was considering, what does considering mean? As I was thinking, suddenly. What does the word suddenly mean? It means quickly, very rapidly, very quickly. Suddenly a male goat 
came from the west across the surface of the whole earth, and it didn't even touch the ground. It had a notable horn between its eyes. Then he came to the ram that I had seen with two horns, uh, which was standing beside the river, and he ran into him with furious power. Clearly this goat has issues. He's mad as a hornet. He runs at the ram and he thrashes it into oblivion. Verse 7. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him. He attacked the ram. He broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground. He trampled on him and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Oh, I wonder who the goat is. Now, just based on what you know already, just, just based on simple history and what we've seen in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, who was it that conquered Medo-Persia? Who do you think this goat might be? Oh, look down at verse 21. Same chapter. Here it is. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Greece. So notice, the Bible interprets itself. Okay, is that clear, everyone? The kingdom of Greece and the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. And who was that? Alexander the Great. So, notice we're going over some of the same ground that we saw in Daniel 2. So we're here, Medo-Persia to Greece, that we saw in Daniel 7. Here, Medo-Persia to Greece. By the way, remember, Greece moved very rapidly. Very what? And what was that word we just saw there? Suddenly. Suddenly. Right? So it's all the same. That's the great thing about Bible prophecy. Once you get one thing right, and then you get two things right, and then you get three things right, it just begins to cascade and it gets easier and easier. But if you get one thing wrong, guess what happens? You get everything else wrong. Think of it this way. If you want to go due north 100 miles, if you want to go due north 100 miles, how many steps have to be due north? Every single step. And what's the most important step? Your first step. That's right. So if you get the first step right, it's easier to get the second step right, and it's easier to get the third and the fourth. But if we make an error on that first step, we're bound to make an error on the second, third, fourth down the line. So far, so good. So let's continue the vision here. Verse 8. Therefore, the male goat grew what? My Bible says very great. Now, the ram was what? Great. Right? The ram was great, but the male goat is very great. Do you see an increase? An increase in power? So the ram is great. The male goat is very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. That's Alexander the Great. Was broken. And in place of it, how many notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven? Four. What, what does that remind us of? Ah, oh, the four heads of the leopard. Are you beginning to see? Very simple. Four notable ones come up. Now, this is where things get amazing. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now this is where people say, whoa, whoa, slow down. We missed Rome. What, what, what happened to Rome? Did you think that maybe? Because look at, we went from, notice this, we went from the ram. Who was the ram? Who was the ram? Me to Persia. And then we went to the goat. Who's the goat? Greece. And now we're at the little horn. The little horn is papal Rome. Well, hmm. We're missing pagan Rome. No, we're not. Not at all. Because both, think of it this way. Think of it this way. In Daniel chapter 2, here's Rome, right? The long legs of iron is what? Rome. But what was down in the feet? Divided Rome. But what was it made of? Iron and clay. So notice this. Rome just changes but still exists right down to the very end. You see that? Still Rome, but it just, it changes and it exists right down to the very end. Think of this horrific beast here. What's the fourth beast? Rome. And then what grows out of Rome? Those horns. So those horns continue to grow, 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 grow. So Rome continues, but it just takes on a different manifestation. Rome transitioned from being primarily a civil power to being an ecclesiastical power or a spiritual power. Does that make sense? And so you really have two distinct phases of Rome. You have civil Rome, or if you prefer, pagan Rome. And then you have papal Rome, or if you prefer, spiritual Rome. But both are Rome. Okay? Now look at this. Bible students, put your thinking caps on. Look at verse 9. It says, And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now, I want you to notice that this little horn is moving in three directions, and it's all on a horizontal plane. Look at it again until you see it. Toward the south, toward the which? The east, and toward the glorious land. So here, the, the, the primary emphasis of the little horn's conquests were along a horizontal plane. These are political or military conquests. 
But watch what happens in the next. You see the distinction there. In, in the first verse, he's moving on a horizontal plane. In the next verse, he's moving upward even to heaven. And so that's what we find here. And in, in, uh, this should actually be, uh, let's see, have I moved on? I haven't yet. Let's look at our next one. I think this should be Daniel chapter... No, that's not Daniel. Okay, we'll just keep going. I think I've got it here. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Hallelujah. There we go. Meet of Persia, right? That's what we saw, the ram. Then Greece. That's the goat. You're all flipping your things over as you can get it. And then the little horn moving on a terrestrial plane. That is a horizontal plane, right? Pushing southward, pushing westward, and pushing toward the glorious land, which was Jerusalem. Pushing toward the, the, Jewish, toward the Jewish homeland. Okay? Then the next thing you see is the little horn begins his attack, but now he's not moving just on this plane. He's moving on the vertical plane, and he begins to attack even heaven itself. You say, wait a minute, how could he attack heaven itself? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. Okay? Now, let's continue this. This is going to be, this is so amazing. Look at verse 11. Okay? Are we all there? Okay, I know you're writing, so I'll give you just a little moment there. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. The first word is he. The first word is what? He. He is the little horn. Okay? Now I want you to notice what he does in verse 11. It is absolutely audacious. Okay? Verse 11. He even exalted himself as high as who? The prince of the host. Now who's the prince of the host? Jesus Christ. Do you see the vertical movements now? Yes or no? Okay, so, I mean, this little horn begins to vaunt himself even against Jesus. And by him, the daily was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. He begins a spiritual attack and begins to throw down even the sanctuary of God. Look at verse 12. Because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth to the ground. He did all of this and he prospered. Notice he's, this, this is a spiritual battle. I mean, listen, beloved, he's casting truth to the ground. He's making war with God's people. He's making war with God's son. He is throwing God's sanctuary to the ground. That's a spiritual battle. That's a what? Spiritual, spiritual battle. Now, already any Israelite, any Jew who was studying his scriptures would have already known that because in the transition from Daniel chapter 7, we go to these, from these predatorial unclean beasts to Daniel chapter 8 and we're dealing with sanctuary beasts, rams and goats. Does that make sense? So anyone's going to immediately notice, oh, this is dealing more with spiritual issues, not political machinations primarily. Now this gets amazing. You're there at the uh, top of page 2. It says... List the four things that the little horn of Daniel 8 attacks. Number one, he attacks God's people. Number one, he attacks God's people. Let's just look at a couple of those verses. You can write these verses down. Look at verse 24. Verse 24. It says, His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and he shall prosper and thrive, and he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. So here we see this little horn making war against God's people. God's what, everyone? People. people. And we saw that already there. Look at verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will be the vision concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation and the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? How long is this little rascal going to make war with God's people and thrash them? That's basically what's happening. So number one, he makes war with God's people. Number two, he makes war with God's son. We already saw that there, didn't we? He exalts himself in verse 11 against the prince of the host. And then look at verse 25, as if that's not enough. Verse 25. Speaking of this anti-Christian power, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. He shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. And look at this. He shall even rise against the who? The prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. Who is the prince of peace? Jesus Christ. Who's king of kings and lord of lords? Okay, so who would be the prince of princes? 
Jesus Christ. And that's what Daniel's saying here. I mean, the angel's explaining the vision to Daniel, and Daniel can hardly believe it. He sees this little horn destroying God's people, and then he begins to make war even with Jesus. So, well, how would you ever make war with Jesus? I mean, do you just transport up into heaven and get an arm wrestling match with Jesus? No, 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 no. You begin to obscure the place of Jesus. You set up your own sacrifices by taking away from the sacrifice of Jesus. You set up your own priesthood by taking away from the priesthood of Jesus. You set up your own sanctuary and temple by taking away from the sanctuary and temple of Jesus. So the minds of people in the dark ages, particularly when they didn't have the guess what? They didn't have the Bible, and the, the only show in town basically says, you want forgiveness, you come to our priest. You want a sacrifice, you come to our mass. You, you, wanna, uh, you, you want a temple, you come to our sanctuary. The only show in town is basically obscuring the person of Jesus, and in doing that, they're making war with the real Jesus. Is that clear, everyone? And, I mean, the people didn't have their Bibles. They, they, they didn't know that the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I mean, they didn't know all of this. And so the priest says this, and the cardinal says this, and the prelate says this, and the pope says this. And they... It was the Dark Ages. It was the what? The Dark Ages. And so this power makes war with God's people, and it makes war with God's Son. And look at verse 12 again. It says in verse 12, He even cast truth to the ground. So number three, He makes war with God's truth. Clearly, this is a spiritual battle. And then number four, he makes war with God's sanctuary, God's temple. We already read it, but look at verse 13 again. It says, how long will the sanctuary and the host be trampled underfoot? So Daniel's seeing all of this in vision. Let's go back and sort of review it so we can see it. Daniel sees uh, Medo-Persia. Okay, okay, that's fine. He sees the ram. And then he sees Greece. That's fine. He sees the goat. And then he begins to see this little horn power come up that moves on a horizontal plane. That's what we would call pagan Rome. But then that thing is not satisfied moving on a horizontal plane, and it begins to move on what kind of a plane? A vertical plane and begins to make war with God, with God's people, with God's truth, with God's son, with God's sanctuary. Begins to make a spiritual warfare against God. Daniel's watching all of this in vision. And he overhears a discussion, a conversation between two angels. That's verses 13 and 14. Here it is. Then I heard, Daniel speaking, a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one. So now Daniel's listening in on a heavenly conversation. And one said, how long will be the vision concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation to give the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? In other words, one is saying, how long is this garbage going to go on? I mean, really? How long is God going to tolerate this? And the answer is in verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. That is the longest time prophecy in all of the Bible. You just read it. Two th how many days was it? 2,300 days. Notice that that time period, 2,300 days, is in direct response to the question, how long is this going to go on? Oh, 2,300 days. Now, right there, you're on page two. Let's take a look at it. By the way, you will need this for tomorrow night. We are not going to make it through all of this. So this, this is your lesson for tonight and on... Monday night, so be sure to not lose this one, okay? The longest time prophecy in the Bible is found in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. It deals with a time period stretching from the time of Daniel all the way down to the last days. That's what you'd write in there. Remember that a day in end time Bible prophecy equals a what? A year. That's exactly right. A year in literal time. That's absolutely essential. We've given you two verses there, Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. Now, even right there in the immediate context of Daniel chapter 8, it is clear that the days of the 2300-year prophecy could not be literal 24-hour days. Consider that 2300 literal days would reach a mere seven years into the future. Yet the angel Gabriel, who came to interpret the vision for Daniel, made it clear that the vision pertained to the time of the end. Okay, you're still there in your Bibles. Pick up your Bible, look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 17. Okay? Daniel chapter 8 and verse 17. We'll actually pick it up in verse 15. This is Gabriel. Gabriel comes to explain the vision. Verse 15. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I was seeking the meaning, and suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. Boom! This figure stands before Daniel. 
Verse 16, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man... Oh, that sounds good with my voice low. Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he, verse 17, Gabriel came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. But he said to me, I fell on my face, he said to me, Understand, son of man... That's speaking to Daniel. Gabriel speaking to Daniel. He's come to explain the vision. Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the what? Yeah. The time of the end. So Daniel, Daniel's sitting there just absolutely flabbergasted about this vision. Gabriel comes down and says, Daniel, understand something. The vision pertains to the time of the what? Yeah. The end. Now, Daniel lived 600 years before the time of Jesus. 2,300 literal days would reach a whopping seven years into the future. Is that anywhere near the time of the end? No, 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 no. So you have internal evidence that these 2,300 days are not literal days, but in prophecy, just as water represents what in Bible prophecy? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And, and what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? A kingdom or a nation. What does a horn represent? A power, that's exactly right. What does a woman represent? A church. Okay, what does a prophetic day represent? A year. a year. It's all symbolic. And you have internal evidence right there. Gabriel shows up and he says, hey, listen, the vision has to do with the end of time, the last days. Now look at verse 24 of the same chapter. Pardon me, verse 26. Gabriel still speaking. By the way, this isn't David Asterix speaking. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. Gabriel says, And the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers, my Bible says, to many days in the future. Do you all see that? Many days. Now, is seven years many days in the future? Not at all. He says, many, seal this vision up, Daniel. Just seal it up. Why was he told to seal it up? Because primarily it didn't pertain to his time. Seal it up, Daniel. This vision has to do with people living down at the end of time. In fact, I cannot resist. Go to Daniel chapter 12. I just can't resist, so you're going to have to forgive me. Daniel chapter 12, look at this. Okay, verse 4. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and do what to the book? Seal the book until the when? Yeah. The time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will what? God says, Daniel, seal the book, and it will be unsealed at the end of time. Now, why? Why? Let's think about that for just a moment. Is God here being arbitrary? Is God saying, you know, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, I know it, and you don't? No! Think about it. Daniel lived 600 years before the time of Jesus. Why can we understand the prophecies of Daniel today? Because we live in a place where we can look back through history and see its fulfillment. Does that make sense? That was a luxury not afforded Daniel. Daniel lived 600 years before the time of Jesus. Here we live 2,000 years after the time of Jesus. So we can look back and we can say, oh yeah, there was Babylon. Yep, saw it. Medo Persia. Yep, yep, yep. Greece. Yeah. Rome. Yeah. Rome divided. Yeah. Little horn. We can see it from where we're standing in history. Does that make sense? So the sealing of Daniel's prophecy till the time of the end was not God arbitrarily saying, well, you know, just at the end of time, it was God saying people won't really be able to grasp the significance of these prophecies until they have the historical landscape to look back over and say, wow, it fits exactly as God said. He saying, amen? Powerful. And that's basically what Gabriel says when he comes down. He says, hey, Daniel, seal it up until the time of the end, because this vision has to do with many days in the future. That's how we know that those 2,300 days cannot be literal days. Impossible. Impossible. There's internal evidence right there. Now, you're still there. Second page. Paragraph that says, according. According to the last verse of this chapter, Daniel was astonished at the vision, but he did not understand it. In fact, let's look at that. Daniel chapter 8. Look at the very last verse of Daniel chapter 8. Verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted. And I was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and I went about the king's business. And I was astonished by the vision, but no one what? Okay, just a question for you here. Does Daniel understand the vision? No. Now, he must have understood some of it because the angel told him, oh yeah, the ram is me to Persia. I mean, Daniel wasn't stupid. He would have known that. And, and the, the goat was what? Greece. Okay, so he would have understood some of it, but he didn't understand all of it. 
He says, hey, at the end of the thing, I was astonished. In fact, I was so, I was so crushed by what I saw that little horn doing to God's people, God's truth, God's sanctuary, and God's son. He says, I, was, I fainted. Remember, beloved, God, Daniel wasn't at the cinema. Daniel wasn't at the movie. Daniel was seeing a real power making a real war against real people. I mean, historians tell us that between 50 and 100 million martyrs gave their lives for no greater crime than wanting to know and live by this word. Now, just imagine seeing that in vision. Daniel was crushed. He was devastated. That's why when he listened in on that conversation, one angel said, well, how long is this going to go on? I mean, really, how long is this going to go on and God's going to allow his sanctuary and his host and his truth and his son to be trampled underfoot by this rampaging little horn power? And he said, hey, listen, this isn't going to go on forever. 2,300 days, tough it out, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, does the vision make sense at least broadly, yes or no? It's actually quite a simple vision, so let's continue here. Okay, so we're right there on that same paragraph. He even fainted. Why was he so troubled after all? The answer is quite simple. Daniel had just seen in vision that this little horn would wage a very effective war against God. His truth and his people, and that it would last for a very long period of time, more than a thousand years. Daniel had already seen his own beloved city, Jerusalem, sacked by the armies of Babylon, and now in vision, he sees even more trouble and calamities for God's people. This was serious stuff for Daniel. This was no Hollywood movie. Can you say amen? amen. I mean, Daniel was, was visibly shaken. He says, ah, I fainted. I fainted. So there we go, the accusations of the little horn. Bottom of that page. The kangaroo courts and trials of the little horn, the Antichrist, stand in direct opposition and contradiction to the findings of God's heavenly court. These false trials actually found God's people guilty of blasphemy. What a mockery. Now here is an important point. The judgment of Daniel 7. The what? The judgment of Daniel 7 and the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8 are synonymous events. They're the same event. That is, they describe the same thing. In order to understand this, we must turn our attention to the Israelite sanctuary. But before we do that, I want to be sure this is crystal clear. Let's review. Okay, you might think, oh, we're reviewing again. We're going to review, and I'll tell you why. Okay, let's go. What was the sequence that we saw three times in Daniel 7? Rome, little horn, judgment. Clear on that, everyone? Okay, three times. Rome, little horn, judgment. And remember, judgment was given in favor of who? Why? Because, beloved, uh, let's try and wrap our, our, our fingers around this historically. This anti-Christian power is arraigning God's people before these kangaroo courts of prelates and pontiffs and cardinals and priests and charging them with blasphemy because they wanted to know the Bible, because they wanted to follow Jesus, because they didn't want to have to go along with all of the traditions and accoutrements of the church. And they, and they would stand there in their mighty regalia looking down at these cowering individuals before them who just wanted to serve the Lord. And they would burn them at the stake or throw them to the lions as a guilty of blasphemy. I mean, many occasions, you can just read it, it's all history, they would take caps and, and put these sort of dunce cap looking things on them as they burned them that would say heretic and, and blasphemer. And these were the true people of God. And they would call these, you know, great councils together to basically condemn God's people. And God looks down and says, no, no. Now, step back, of course, into their mind. From their mindset, this church was the only church in town. It was the only show in town. From their perspective, when the, when the prelate said, or the bishop said, or the pope said, or the cardinal said, hey, listen, you're excommunicated. From, from their perspective, without having the Bible, we take the Bible so for granted. From their perspective, they are eternally lost. They're going to burn throughout the ceaseless eternal ages in the fires of hell because some man said so. I mean, these people were literally living in the most terrible darkness. That's why we call it the dark ages. So, so the people of God were being arraigned before these kangaroo courts, and God says, enough! I'll call my own court to session. And that's why we saw Rome, Little Horn. What was the next thing we saw? 
The judgment was seated. Why? Because of the pompous words of the little horn and because of the persecution of God's people. God sets his own judgment and says, I'm going to undo, I'm going to overturn all of these kangaroo court judgments with the true heavenly judgment in favor of my people. Amen. That's the scene. That's the scene you got to have in your mind. And you know what the verdict of that court is? The verdict of that court is that everyone who puts their faith in Jesus gets the kingdom of God. Amen. You say amen. amen. That's every one of us. That's why, listen, the judgment is not bad news for you, beloved. If you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that Jesus is your advocate. That means he's your lawyer and he's your judge. Now think of it. Can you have a better situation? Your defense lawyer is your judge. That's a can't-lose situation. I'm looking across the room over here at one of my brothers who's a lawyer. I'm looking at Brother Cobb. and I, That's a win-win situation, isn't it, Brother Cobb? You can't lose. The, you know, we think, oh, the judgment, all of my deeds are going to come up. Listen, beloved, you know what's going to happen in the judgment? God is going to hide the record of your pathetic life in the perfect, righteous life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's what's going to happen to you in the judgment. You, beloved, that's why you find David in the Psalms. He's not saying, oh, I'm so afraid of the judgment, I could faint and die. He's saying, he's saying oh, Lord, judge your people. Amen. Many times you find David saying in the Psalms, judge me, O God, because he knew he'd put his faith. He had put his faith in a perfect God, and that perfect God could handle his case. Amen? Amen. So God convenes his court in direct opposition to these Mickey Mouse courts that were taking place down here on earth. And remember again, all these people, as far as they were concerned, they didn't have the Bible. They're looking at it thinking, oh, this is the church. These are the cardinals. These are the priests. We must obey. Are you beginning to see this in your mind? Yes or no? Very powerful. Now, I only got four minutes left, so I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, to advance, but we've got to do that just very quickly. Very, very quickly. A heavenly model. You see there, this is we're, this two parts. Part one, part two. A heavenly model in the divine drama of salvation. Let's do this. The key, you see that there? That's what you'd write in. The key that unlocks the judgment is found in the Israelite sanctuary. The key that unlocks the judgment is found in the Israelite sanctuary. The cleansing of the sanctuary was a day of judgment for Israel, symbolizing the final judgment. Okay? So far, so good? The cleansing of the sanctuary took place on what's called the Day of Atonement. How many of you have heard that before, the Day of Atonement? Okay. The word atonement is a very easy word to understand. It divides neatly into three parts. At, one, meant. The Day of Atonement was the day when God was once again at one with His people. Amen? Okay? The Day of Atonement, otherwise known as Yom Kippur. That's what you can write in there, Yom Kippur, the Day of Judgment. In order to understand the Day of Atonement, we must understand, at least in a basic sense, the purpose and drama of the Israelite sanctuary. There were two main services that were carried out in the sanctuary. How many services? Two. two. Certainly there were many ceremonies and rituals, but they can be roughly divided into two main categories, the daily service and the yearly service. Okay? How many services? Daily service and the yearly service. Okay? The yearly service took place on the 10th day of the 7th month. That was the Day of Atonement. Okay? Now this is basically how it worked, and this will be a perfect place for us to stop. Okay? There are basically three compartments to the Israelite sanctuary. How many compartments? Three. Okay, very simple. And here's, this is like if you were in a helicopter looking down on it. Okay? So here's the three areas. Number one would be the courtyard. In fact, you see there at the bottom of this page, I give you the opportunity to draw this out. I'd recommend you do that. Okay? There, number one, that's the courtyard, and that, that crisscross grid there represents the altar. Okay? Just behind that, that blue circle represented the laver or the wash bin where the priests would wash themselves before going in to the sanctuary, which is represented by the black sections there. Okay? Now, the sanctuary, this is where you're actually entering a room. Out here, you're still in the out of doors, but there in two and three, you're actually entering into a room, and that room had two parts. How many parts? Two, two parts. The first that you would step into was called the, was called the holy place. 
the holy place. Okay? And then in front of you there was a large curtain, very heavy curtain, and on the other side of that curtain was the most holy place. Okay? The most holy place, incidentally, was a perfect cube. It was a perfect cube. It was perfectly square on all sides. Incidentally, very interesting. When you go to Revelation 21 and 22, the New Jerusalem is a perfect cube. You read it. It's just as wide as it is tall as it is long, representing the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Okay? So, there were three parts. The courtyard, the holy, holy place, and the most holy place. This pattern here, this sanctuary was not something that Moses made up. It wasn't something that Aaron made up. It wasn't something the Israelites got together and made up. God showed this to Moses. Who showed it to him? God. In fact, that's what we're going to learn tomorrow. This was, or pardon me, Monday. This was a picture of the temple in heaven. Three places. The courtyard, the holy place, in the most holy place, okay? And the daily services centered around numbers one and two. But the yearly service, the day of atonement, the day of what? Atonement. Or the day of judgment centered around, guess which number? Three. Number three, you've got it. And what we're going to discover in our next two lessons, I praise the Lord Jesus, we've made good time tonight. What we're gonna discover in our next two lessons is exactly how this sanctuary, I mean, what does that mean there in Daniel 8, 14? The sanctuary will be cleansed. We're going to discover exactly what that means from a biblical perspective. Can you say amen? amen? So two questions as we close tonight. By the way, I knew that this was going to get cut right in the middle. It's just way too much information to present in a single... I actually did it one time and it took me two and a half hours. We're not going to even try that. Okay? But here's the two things I want to know. Number one, tonight's presentation, up to this point, do we at least broadly feel clear about what we're looking at? Yeah. Okay? Pretty simple. All we've done is looked at Daniel chapter 8 primarily. Daniel chapter 8 is just a recapitulation of Daniel chapter 7. Medo-Persia, Greece, Little Horn, Judgment. Okay? Pretty simple. And then we're ending here by looking at these three elements. These three elements. Courtyard, holy place, most holy place. Okay? And let me tell you, our next message is entitled, not tomorrow night, but the following night. It's entitled, Perfect Prophetic Proof of the Identity of Jesus. If you've ever had anyone ask you, a skeptic or an unbeliever, say to you, well, how do you know Jesus is the guy? I will give you rock-solid prophetic proof that unmistakably, what word did I say? Unmistakably points to Jesus of Nazareth as the only guy. As we look at this, a powerful prophecy, you're just going to go, whoa, praise God in heaven. You will have one of the most powerful quivers in your arsenal to share with skeptics, with unbelievers, and with Christians alike that will root your faith and ground your faith in the absolute, total truthfulness of God's Word. Can you say amen?